Well, what a privilege and an honor to be here this morning and to share the Word of God with you. I'm so excited uh, and um, just give God all the glory for this opportunity. Anytime you get to minister or to speak to the people of God, I count it as a privilege. Uh, I'd just like to take this time to pray before we dive into the Word of God. And I believe that the Lord has a message for you this morning. Uh, Father, we thank you for your word, that your word does not return to you void, that you sent forth your word and it healed us. You sent forth your word and it, and it delivered us. You sent forth your word that we might be set free and be free indeed. For he who the Son is set free is free indeed. So Father, thank you for your word this morning. I pray, Jehovah, that even as your word goes through to your people, that their lives will never be the same again. I pray for transformation to take place in their lives. I pray for change. I pray that, my God, you touch them at their hearts and their lives will never be the same. So we give you all the praise and all the glory for what you're doing and the plans that you have for your people. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen and Amen. We're going to drive straight into the Word this morning. Um, we, when, from Matthew to Malachi, when you read the Word, from Matthew to Malachi, we are anticipating the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of Jesus. Uh, the prophets that speak there and are prophetic about the arrival of Christ. The Bible is talking in the Old Testament about Christ, the Messiah, coming that there is a Savior that's coming. Uh, and we see this throughout all the books. From Genesis, God begins to redeem man. God begins his redemption for man. And we get to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we go to John. And God is, is we're now in diving into or have different versions uh, that are collective about Christ's life, how Jesus lived his life. And these are, that's the collection that we have from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. From, their, from four perspectives that we get to see Jesus, who comes to redeem us, who comes to make us new, who comes to, 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 to pull us from death to life. And the book of Acts is very, very interesting because the book of Acts focuses and zeroes in on us as believers. It zeroes in on the church or the body of Christ. And as we come this morning before God, I'd like us to zero in on the book of Acts. And from, from January to now, I've been in the book of Acts and probably for, the, for probably a large portion of this year, I will dwell in the book of Acts. I'm very intrigued with the book of Acts. Acts is the blueprint of how we ought to do church. Acts is the blueprint of what church ought to be. And we began to realize how Christians became Christians from the book of Acts. How, what message they preached in the book of Acts. So today our portion of scripture, we're going to take it from Acts chapter 3. And uh, we're going to read a story. And this story is a two-part story. It's a two-part story because um, we're going to read X3, but you cannot understand X3 without understanding X4 because they are entwined. What do I mean by that? That it's a continuation. It's a story. It's one story that is cut into two. So the chapter 3 and chapter 4 are talking about the same story, but it's cut into two. So we're going to dive into this, as, and I want, you to, I want you to go on a journey with me. And as we read each verse, as we read each scripture, we're going to dissect uh, lessons that we're going to pull out from those scriptures that will change our lives and transform our lives. Amen. And so let's jump in. Acts chapter 3, reading from verse 1, and I'm reading from the King James. It says, Now Peter and John, together in the went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Now Peter and John together went up, or now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer. So we are told of their destination. Their destination is the temple. We are told what they are going to do there. They are going to pray. It was the hour of prayer. 
And so the ninth hour was specifically um, identified with prayer. It was a time for them to go and pray. I want to start off by saying that we ought to pray as believers. We ought to pray as believers. You cannot be a believer and not pray. It is impossible for you to survive as a believer and not pray. Jesus says, when you pray, you shall pray like this. When you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray. And it's important that we pray as believers. I cannot emphasize this enough. So Peter and John went up to the temple to pray, and this time it was the ninth hour. You have to pray. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot emphasize this enough, and I can literally spend the whole sermon just on verse 1. But I'd like us to move from verse 1. But I want to zero in a bit on the, prayer, on the praying aspect, how important it is for us to pray. We have been told that it is the intercessor's duty for, to pray on our behalf. So we have left it to the intercessors. But it is your duty and due diligence as a believer to pray. You ought to pray. 1 Thessalonians uh, 5.17 says, Pray without ceasing. Those three words, pray without ceasing. What does that scripture mean? That means that if you pray and you don't stop praying, you will get tired. If you continue to pray, you will lose income because you're not got to work. But what does pray without ceasing mean? It means every opportunity you get to pray, you got to pray. You got to pray. In Matthew, uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And he told them a parable saying, talking about the judge who neither feared God nor had any regard for man. He said to him, he told them that parable to say, to tell them that men ought to pray and not faint. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I've come to tell you, you got to pray. You got to pray. Your survival is dependent upon prayer. Let me tell you something, I'm going to say it, and this is going to, it's, it's not going to sit down well with most people, but it's the truth. The people, if you want to know how big your congregation is, or the size of your congregation, it is not the people that come in on Sunday. It is the people that attend your prayer meeting. That's how, that's the capacity of your church, or that's how big your church is. People who come in on Sunday mornings only, are religious folk, people who know that I have to be in service on a Sunday, religiously, are religious folk. But people who are building an intimate relationship and have a relationship with the master have studied and understood that I have to pray. I got to pray. It is paramount that you pray. Pray. If you can join a prayer meeting, pray. In your closet, pray. As a church, we ought to pray. We have not become effective because we have not prayed. Jesus, before he leaves, he says to his disciples, Go tarry ye in Jerusalem until you receive power. What does that tarry mean? Pray. Go wait in prayer. Chapter 2. I want to I wanna read this. Um, uh, in, in chapter 2, that where it talks about the children, where God has encouraged them, sorry, in chapter 1, verse 14, it says, and they continued with one accord in prayer. They continued in one accord in prayer and supplication. So we ought to pray. I can go and spend so many scriptures on, on, on talking about prayer. But before I go, I want to talk about David. David is a man after God's own heart. And this is what the Bible says about David. Well, when one David is praying, this is what, when David is writing a psalm, this is what he says. This is uh, Psalms 55, verse, I'm going to read the verse 16 and verse 17. It says, as for me, I will call upon God, and the God shall save me. I love the confidence of David. I will call upon God, and God shall save me. Verse 17, when will I call upon God? He says, evening and morning, and at noon. Will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice? Ladies and gentlemen, we ought to be a people of prayer. 
So it was about the ninth hour. Let's continue with our story real quick. It was about the ninth hour. They went to the temple to pray. And the Bible says that a certain man, verse 2, a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom had been daily, who they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which was called beautiful, to ask alms that he may that that entered into the temple, of them that entered into the temple. So he said. From his mother's womb, that means that this man knew nothing else but to go to the to, to be taken to the gate beautiful and to beg from his mother's womb. And when you begin to read verse uh, verse 21 of chapter 4, no, verse 22 of chapter 4, it says, For the man was about 40 years old to whom this miracle had happened. But before we get to the miracle, he was above 40 years. Ladies and gentlemen, for how long shall we come to church and nothing change in our lives? For how long shall we have ministry and not experience a change? For 40 years, this man sat by the temple, by the gate beautiful, the entrance to the church. People have been are in need and have been attending church for 40 years, 40 years to beg for alms. That he means that his priorities shifted because when he started believing God for healing, he, he realized that healing is not coming and therefore lost hope. And what he expected was arms. What he expected was to be given something. I came to speak to somebody this morning that you have given up hope. You have been waiting so long, you have given up hope. For 40 years, he stood by the gate beautiful. He, 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 they, they carried him to the gate beautiful, rather, and laid him by the gate beautiful. For 40 years, for 40 years, he was by the gate beautiful. And sometimes we get situations that prolong. The Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I wonder how many sick hearts am I talking to? People who have lost hope because we have been waiting and waiting and waiting and nothing seems to happen. I came to talk to somebody this morning that you got to trust in God once more. you got to believe. So verse 3 says, on seeing Peter and John go into the temple, asked for alms. On seeing Peter and John asked for alms. What do people see when they see you? Mm -hmm. What do people see when they see you? What do people expect from you when they see you? Are they expecting alms? Because they've given up hope because all they know that you can give them is arms. What are people expectant when they see you? What are they expecting? The next verse says, And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. That means do not focus on your problem. Do not focus on anyone else. Block out or tune out the noise around you. Focus on us. Look at us. Where is your focus? If you are believing God for deliverance, where is your focus? Sometimes it takes us tuning out the noise around us for us to receive our miracle. For us to receive our deliverance. For us to receive our breakthrough. Tune out the noise around you. What noise is around you? What noise is around you? So he said, look on us. Look on us. we got to look to the Messiah this morning. we got to look to him who's able to deliver us. we got to look to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Don't look at anything else. Don't look at your problem. Don't look at your problem, no matter how big it is. Don't look at your problem. Don't look at your challenge. 
I came to tell you, don't look at your challenge, but focus on him. Focus on Jesus. Look on us. And he gave heed to them, expecting to receive something. The next thing is that when you focus, when you tune in the noise, you gotta, you got to be expectant. What are you expecting? Every time you get to get into the presence of God, be expectant. Expectant of a miracle. Expectant of a breakthrough. I'm expecting. I might not know what it is, but God, I'm expecting for you to do something in my life. I'm expecting for you to change somebody's life. I'm expecting my healing. Some of us have gotten so used to, to, to being crippled in our lives. Our finances have been crippled. Our livelihoods have been crippled. And we got so used to it to expect nothing else but be expectant this morning. Are you expectant every time you jump into the presence of God? There's a God moment, a God encounter that each and every man of God experienced that changed their lives forever. That transformed their lives forever. And I came to tell you this morning, be expectant. I'm expecting God to come through. I'm expecting God to do something. Every time I go into his presence, it might be for a minute, it might be a few seconds, but I'm expectant. Jesus, every time, if you read the four Gospels, Jesus, every time he got to a man who was lame, he'd say, what do you want me to do for you, lame man? What do you want me to do for you, blind man? What do you want me to do for you, man with a shriveled hand? What do you want me to do for you? In other words, to change that phrase, and given my version is, what are you expectant of me? What are you expectant from the Lord? We got to be expectant. We got to be expecting something. That's why it's important to pray. Because you've got to have expectation levels have got to be high. Expect something to happen. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. I love this scripture. It says this, this portion here. It says, and Peter says, silver and gold have I none. Why could Peter not give him silver and gold? Because Peter did not have silver or gold. You say, silver or gold have I none. But such as I have, give, un give I thee. What do you have? You cannot give what you do not have. You, this really broke my heart and I began to search for God in a way that I, I haven't before. And I began to say, God, you know, what do I have? Before Jesus leaves, he says, go tarry in Jerusalem until you receive power and you shall be my witnesses. The reason why you need to tarry first until you receive power and the Holy Spirit has come upon you is because you will not be effective, you cannot give what you do not have. You will not be effective if you go without the Spirit of God. You will not be effective. And sometimes as a church, we are trying to minister to people out there and give them something that we do not have ourselves. What do you have? He says, silver and gold have I none, but what do you have, Peter? He says, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, rise up and walk. That's what? Peter had. I have the name of Jesus of Nazareth. In that precious name, pick up, wake, get up, and walk. Rise up and walk. This is very, 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 and we're going to touch upon this next week as well. This is very, very important. What do we have to offer? And the Bible says, as we come to a close, 
that then Peter say, uh, in verse 7, he says, And then he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. By the right hand he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. Received strength. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Immediately his ankle bones received strength. And he was leaping. He leaping up stood up. And he leaping up stood and walked and entered to the temple with them. Walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking, leaping, and praising God. Walking, leaping, and praising God. L Ladies and gentlemen, as I have come to share this word with you, I pray that God would move you from a paralyzed state to a walking, leaping, and praising God. That God would do such great things in your life that you say this can only be the finger of God. And I want to just lead us in a time of prayer for a minute and say, Father, may we never be the same again. May we trust God. May we know his word. May we be like people who of prayer, people who seek God. And if you do not know Jesus, this is your opportunity. Real quick, say, Father, I am a sinner. I pray that you'd wash me clean, that you would cleanse me from all unrighteousness, that you'd make me your child. I admit that I have, I have missed the mark, but through Christ Jesus, I come to a moment of repentance, and I pray that Jesus would take the center of my life. I receive you as Lord and Savior, of my life in Jesus mighty name amen may God bless you have an awesome week and stay connected in prayer and in the Word of God and I promise you your life will never be the same again amen